This program is brought to you by the Center for a Sustainable Today. Our world is an amazing, complex living organism, and we coexist in a symbiotic relationship. With this great power comes a great responsibility, a responsibility to ensure the future by taking steps to be sustainable today. Here is the host of Sustainable Today, Jean Bauman. Hi, I'm Jean Bauman, the host of Sustainable Today. This month, we'll hear from former Oregon Governor John Kitzhopper about a very important topic these days, health care. Governor Kitzhopper is heading the Archimedes movement dedicated to bringing about meaningful reform in our health care system. Please join Darcy Hitchcock and Marsha Willard for this stimulating hour on health care. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us again. This is the show that helps you figure out how to be more sustainable at work and at home. Uh, I'm Darcy Hitchcock. And I'm Marcia Willard. And we have in the, in the studio, uh, we wanted to talk about health care, and we couldn't think of a better person to have on but former Governor John Kitzhaber, who's been very busy lately working on that issue. So we will get back to you soon. Marcia, we've got some news, is yes. that right? Yeah, we like to kick off every show with a little bit of news. And um, this month, we're, we picked up items that have mostly to do with um, the environment and health issues. So. Uh, never a shortage of that in the in the newspaper. One of the things we discovered uh, was a Cornell University study that uh, determined that about 40 percent of all the deaths worldwide are caused by pollution related contaminants that is in the air or the water or the soil. 40 percent? What happened to like old age? Uh, well if you get that far you're you're lucky I guess. I guess. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, a lot of this is waterborne disease. About 80% of wa is waterborne, uh, which, you know, leads to things like malaria and things like that. Malaria st still kills about almost 3 million people uh, on the planet every year. Um, and, and when you add to that the growth in population and the ability to spread disease rapidly, globally, um, these contaminants have caused a lot of problems. Well, that part of the study that you're referring to mostly deals with uh, developing nations, yeah. but we have serious problems here in this country, and one of them is antibiotic resistance. We tend to use them too much. I read in the Union of Concerned Scientists, they estimated that about 70% of the antibiotics is used on livestock. Yeah. just to prevent them from getting sick because we crowd them and feed them things that they shouldn't be eating. And so we're losing our ability to use that. And then you add in travel. People can travel around. So there was that case of that guy showing up with TV <laughs> and everybody <laughs> freaking out. And the then pariah honeymoon, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then if, if we think we're safe from these problems that they have in the developing world, climate change is spreading the, uh, because it's ex uh, changing where the climate mm -hmm. is warm, it's spreading things like malaria and mm -hmm. You know, West Nile virus is here now. And here so, in Oregon, right. Yeah. So malaria couldn't, may, may not be far on its heels. The other thing I uncovered in a number of stories was about environmental impacts uh, and exposure for kids. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a study last month done by the public, California public health researchers that established a link between autism and pesticides, uh, specifically organochlorines. Um, and, you know, I've been reading about the increase in autism rates in uh, children born in this decade, and, you know, so it makes you wonder whether there's there's something in the environment that's doing that. Well, you mentioned kids. Well, there's <clears throat> been all these uh, recalls uh, for the, uh, products from China, all these toys. United Healthcare had a, a, um, a nice uh, article about all the recalls, and so we've had uh, toys recalled because of lead-based paint, yeah. and then we had toothpaste recalled because it had basically antifreeze in it um, in another country, and then clothes uh, that were being uh, recalled because of formaldehyde, and then the dyes. Um, Europe apparently has banned some of these dyes, but we haven't gotten around to that, so we're still exposed to it. Yeah, and I understand the formaldehyde will wash out over 
over time, but the dyes don't. Oh. The dyes stay in clothes even after laundering. But I found some good news in oh, a, good. an Environment News Service report, um, speaking of toys, and we had an earlier show about toxins, and we talked specifically about toxic toys and the plastics that they're made of. Uh, there's now a manufacturer of bio-based renewable plastics who's making a new line of environmentally friendly toys, and the toys are made from a polymer that's derived uh, by the fermentation of dextrose. And if you went to high school science, you'll know that dextrose is a form of sugar. And so I hope they I, don't I, eat it or suck <laughs> on it because then they'll have dental yeah, problems. Toys from sugar. How cool is that? Uh, uh, it can't get much better yeah. than that. <laughs> well, we've been talking here about things that can make people sick, but once they do get sick, then we have the problem of can they get to health care. And so, John, we're so pleased to have you on the show. Thanks, Everybody, too. I'm sure, knows of you as our former governor and the... You wrote the Oregon Health Plan, and, and since, you're, uh, since you've been out of office, you've been a very busy guy, I, I understand. So tell us a little bit about this Archimedes movement that you've been involved with. What is that, and what are you working on? Well, we started it a couple of years ago, and it's based on the belief that many of the, the programs that we use in the areas of really not just health care, but education, environmental stewardship, were all created back in the middle of the last century. <laughs> and the world has changed pretty significantly since then, but those programs still reflect a set of circumstances and assumptions which in many cases are no longer valid. Right. Uh, and the political process is very resistant to changing those programs. Uh, and so... Uh, well, like, what are some of those assumptions that you're alluding to? Well, we, uh, for example, about 60% of us get our health care through uh, our place of employment. Right. Now, the fact that we have an employment-based system really was an accident of history. It grew out of the labor shortage of the Second World War when 17 million people went off to, to fight. And normally during a labor shortage, employers raise wages to attract and retain workers. But because we had wage and price controls in effect, mm -hmm. they began offering what was considered a non-monetary benefit, which really? is replaced based health care. Huh. I had no and idea. And then in 1954, uh, Congress granted employers essentially a tax benefit for offering that coverage, which is what created the incentives that led to our current system. The problem is that when when we really created the incentives that led to that system in 1954, no one could have envisioned that 50 years later we'd have a highly competitive global economy that would put U.S. businesses at a significant disadvantage with employers all over the world that don't have to pick up that cost. Right. So we have to create a space where we can go back and ask ourselves, has the world changed since the middle of the last century? And should the programs through which, in this case, we deliver health care be sort of updated to reflect the realities of today? Interesting. Uh, and, um, and people so the Archimedes don't just stay movement. In, one, in one place anymore. They move around with different jobs and so forth. Well, exactly. Forth. I mean, workplace-based coverage, which has certainly had many benefits, uh, traps people in, in, in jobs. It mm -hmm. sometimes traps people in unhealthy relationships. Right. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes people shop for the, the employer that offers the health care that will take care of their pre-existing medical condition. It creates all sorts of... Yeah. And really, I mean, it, people should have access to some basic level of health care regardless of who they work for or where they live. So the Archimedes movement essentially was, was trying is trying to create a sort of an alternative space for civic engagement outside the traditional legislative process for individuals at the community level to become engaged in trying to think through what a new, more rational healthcare system would look like, and then to create the tension necessary to actually bring it about through the political process. Fabulous. Well, one of the other reasons we invited you on not was not only because of your background with healthcare and as a medical doctor, certainly that experience, but also because you were our sustainability governor. You wrote the first executive order for sustainability. Right. So we were hoping that you'd be able to speak to the relationship of healthcare, access to healthcare, and sustainability as a social issue. Well, in, in the in the natural resource sense of the word, as I'm sure your viewers know, sustainability really involves using our natural resources at a rate and in a way that allows us to live our lives but doesn't deplete the opportunities for our, 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 our children and our grandchildren. Right. The same is true uh, with social programs, and I think he health care is a classic example of a program that violates the basic tenets of sustainability. Yeah. Today this nation has a $9 trillion national debt. Now, a trillion dollars is so big that it's hard to understand without some After a couple basis commas of comparison. And <laughs> so let me give you out. something that you and your viewers can do at home. Get out your calculator and do the following exercise. Okay, I'll a, write this a, down. A million seconds ago was last week, okay? Uh -huh. A billion seconds ago, Nixon was leaving the White House. Oh. <laughs> a trillion seconds ago was 30,000 B.C. <laughs> So we have a $9 trillion budget deficit, and it's escalating as the population ages. And while Congress is worried about Social Security, the real problem is Medicare. Social Security is about a $5 trillion unfunded liability. But when my generation fully reaches the age of 65, and all of us become eligible for Medicare, which starts in 2011, four years from now, the unfunded 
entitlement in Medicare exceeds $67 trillion. And we're funding that by borrowing money from China and other countries that are still willing to fund U.S. deficit spending. At some point, they won't do that anymore. Right. So the point is that debt. we're <laughs> funding our health care system today by ringing up an enormous bill on our kids' credit card. That, that's not sustainable, nor is right. it fair. We can right. say, you know, we want all the health care money can buy today, but it's not our money we're using anymore. It's our children's money. Right. So I think that, that the, the, one of the real reasons we need to get at the health care is, issue is because of the opportunity costs involved with spending more and more of our resources on this one sector alone. It's squeezing out our ability to invest in the transition to a, a, mm -hmm. a, a renewable economy. It's, it's squeezing out our ability to invest in education and in, in, in rational community development. So it's a huge issue that crosses a lot of, a lot of areas. But boy, I bet it raises all sorts of hackles, too. I mean, you start talking about, you know, reducing funding of, of Medicare or whatever, you, you bring all the lobbyists right well, to your that's doorstep. That's really one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons we created the movement in the first place. All of the programs through which we fund health care today, and the three major programs are Medicare, there's a big public subsidy, about a $200 billion annual subsidy for workplace-based coverage, and then the Medicaid program. The people who currently benefit from those programs engage in the political process not to make sure that we use these resources to make sure all Americans have access not. to health care, but to hold on to the, the, the resources that they have themselves. Right. So you have to somehow create a, a place where you can have a different kind of a discussion. And you know, to put this into context, if you look at the, the factors that really imp impact people's lifetime health statistics, 40% of them are lifestyle and behavioral. Things okay, that we could wow. theoretically do something about. 30% right. are genetics, who, okay. your, who your parents were. 15% uh, are social factors, whether you have a job, have a clean, you know, have a house, have a, you know, live in a clean neighborhood. About 10% are, are, or 5% are environmental factors, and only 10% have anything to do with interaction with the U.S. medical system, hmm. which tells us that we don't have a healthcare system, we have a sick care system. Yeah. What we're really good yes. at in this country is waiting until people are metabolically bankrupt, mm -hmm. and then we can rush in with all this like, technology on mm -hmm. the back end and fix them. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. We have to change the paradigm and figure out ways to keep people out of the healthcare system in the first place, and once they get in, we've got to make sure what we're spending actually is related to a health outcome. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. So tell us, you know, there. I've heard a lot about obesity and all of that, and you were talking about some of those personal choices that people are making and so forth. So what are what are the trends and, and what's the relationship? You, you mentioned environmental was just, I think you said 10%. So how do these things interact? And, and what are the statistics of, um, here in Oregon, if you happen to have those off the top? Well, of I mean, it, the interesting thing is that, that the, the biggest advances in population health mm -hmm. as opposed to individual health, and right. I can make that distinction, which is an important distinction, are not, were not made by medicine, except with the exception of things like the, it, it, you know, uh, uh, the discovery of antibiotics, for yeah, example. That was but big. clean drinking water, uh, public mm -hmm. health measures have had uh, immunizations, have had a much bigger impact on keeping the population healthy. Mm -hmm. That's why many, almost every other industrialized nation has better health statistics than the United States, although they spend vastly less on health care than we do. So it's, it's very important to recognize that health care, that the objective of the health care system shouldn't be the financing delivery of health care. The objective should be to keep people healthy. In other right. words, health care isn't an end in itself, it's a means to an end. And it doesn't have any intrinsic value outside of it, uh, uh, its value as an economic commodity unless it's connected to a health outcome. So, you know, if you want a healthy population, people have to have access to health care that actually produces health, but they also have to take care of themselves. They have to have, there has to be, you know, a clean air and clean water. There's mm -hmm. a relationship between idling your car in traffic and lung problems. Mm -hmm. There's a, a relationship between people who live in, in, in who, who don't uh, ha walk to work. Right. Uh, the, the lack of bicycle paths and, and, uh, and, and uh, walking paths and obesity. So it's not a simple problem, but there's an awful lot we can do to improve our health and the health of our community and our society that we have control over ourselves, that we don't need the government or somebody else to do for us. It's, a, it's an individual choice. And so is the Archimedes movement trying to take that all on, everything from bike paths to access to health care, or is it just trying to take on the access to health care it's, piece? It's, it's, it, if you look at the work we've done, we had a, a piece of legislation we introduced last session, uh, didn't, did not get a, uh, ultimately get a, 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 a hearing on, uh, on the, the amendments to the bill, but it did start the conversation, and mm -hmm. that, in the preamble, recognizes that health is the product not just of medical care, 
but also of education, of housing, of clean air, clean water. And so we want to recognize that so okay. that we don't simply focus on medicine after the fact, that we have to take a much more holistic view if the objective is to keep people healthy rather than simply give them access to medical care. Okay, okay. So we, we understand that in, the, in a recent headline in the Oregonian said that, um, you know, one in six Oregonians are without health care access to, to, you know, a viable system. So what happens to those people? Well, we actually have a policy of universal access in the United States. It's called the emergency room. Uh, when, Very people, when people get sick yeah. enough, they end up going to the emergency room where federal laws require that they be seen and treated. And then those uncompensated costs are simply shifted back to people who can pay through increases in their premiums or their bills. About 10% mm -hmm. of your insurance premium today is basically picking up that cost shift. 10%. 10%. So we end up, for example, treating strokes in the hospital but not managing people's blood pressure in the community. Uh -huh. I mean, we have a system that essentially says we're not going to ensure that all of our women have adequate prenatal care, but we'll be willing to uh, pay the cost of resuscitating a 500 gram infant in neonatal intensive care. Right. It shouldn't be acceptable to any of us. And, and you know, so the point is that yeah. by leaving a growing part of our population without the ability to access needed medical care on the front end, it costs us far more as a society, both economically and human terms, than it would be if we just adopt some explicit policy uh, of coverage. In the, you know, we're going to argue about what's covered, what uh -huh. that basic package is, but there should be no question that everyone in this country uh, should have a timely access to needed, uh, effective uh, uh, right. medical services. I ironically, I read a, a statistic that said in the last year, 51 percent of Americans either um, didn't go to a doctor when they needed to or avoided getting a test or filling a prescription because they couldn't afford to do it. And so they're sabotaging their own well, health the, the, because the, of a... Uh, the, the average premium uh, for a, uh, mm -hmm. a family of four today exceeds, for the first time, exceeds the, uh, the annual income of a full-time minimum wage worker. Wow. So, That's amazing. That's you know, amazing. so I mean, it's it's it's, uh, it's 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 insane. And you know, what we need to ask ourselves all, and we, I'm sure we'll get into this, but yeah. this, unfortunately, this is being defined as just an insurance problem, uh, and actually, it's not really an insurance problem. It's what we're buying with the money, not just yeah. getting everybody covered, but asking ourselves, what is it we're buying, and what's it really, its relationship to making people healthy? Wow, Good that's food amazing. For yeah. Well, we need to get on to the spotlight. So, Marsha, what do you have for us this time? Today, we visit a healthcare provider that adds additional care to the notion of healthcare. The Fan Oak Creek Medical Clinic in southwest Portland is a primary care provider to not only hundreds of patients, but also to its staff and to the greater community. They are probably the first medical clinic in Oregon to utilize solar panels to offset their electricity expense, and they also provide cash incentives to their employees for practicing conservation at home. They work to help ensure that our uh, elementary schools stay open, and they will not abandon you if you happen to go on Medicare. Sustainable Today welcomes Kim Cameron to our program as our newest field reporter. So we'll go now to Kim and the Fano Creek Medical Clinic. Hi, I'm Kim Cameron with Sustainable Today. We're here in southwest Portland at the Fano Creek Clinic talking with Dr. Greg Coodley, the clinic's director. Thank you so much for having us here. Oh, my pleasure. When we were looking into your clinic, we were so impressed with all the sustainable practices from the 2005 City of Portland's Best Award for Energy for the solar panels you installed to incentives you give to your employees for uh, purchasing uh, high mileage cars and washing machines that are energy efficient. Um, we'd love to talk more about that, but what we're here to talk about today is the condition of our health care system and what you're doing to address that, how you're helping. Can you speak more on that? I mean, I think the health care system is sort of a mess. I think people know that. Um, the fact that we have so many people who don't have health insurance um, is, I think, sort of a disgrace. Um, and that we haven't been able to figure out a way to solve that issue um, over many years is, um, you know, I don't think there's really a good excuse for. So um, I think that there's a number of aspects. There's more than one healthcare system. I think for people who have insurance, it's um, in many ways a very good health care system um, with pretty, you know, very good access to doctors, including uh, particularly specialists. Um, 
the the problem I think of course is for people who either don't have insurance or have an insurance that um, that a lot of people don't take for example one of the biggest problems is because um, how much med Medicare pays is significantly less than commercial insurance a lot of physicians mm -hmm. have stopped seeing Medicare patients how is your clinic um approaching this problem and trying to help? I mean, we're committed that we're not going to dump our Medicare patients. Um, we can't, you know, we, we can't take everybody, but the patients who've been in our practice, um, you know, no matter what insurance they have, we're going to keep seeing them. Um, we've tried to do a sliding fee scale for people who don't have insurance. One of the ways to to try and control costs and keep people healthy is to, is to keep them healthy, keep them out of the hospital. Um, and that's where we think primary care has a lot to offer. That when, and I think the studies show that when people have a regular doctor who they can see, they're much more likely to get regular care, to get preventive care, not to use the emergency room as their first mm -hmm. provider, which is a very expensive way to get care. And so, um, and we're trying to do what we can in terms of preventative care to prevent people from having heart attacks or strokes um, and try and be as aggressive as possible to keep people healthy as long as possible. Can you speak about the Fangorn program you have? Because in our system health care insurance is so tied to, to work, one of the problems is people would lose their job and then um, there is a COBRA that can pay, which tends to be expensive, mm -hmm. and after, after a while then they lose that, and then they lose their health insurance. So we had the idea on a limited basis um, or to sort of pilot where we would pay for health insurance for people who had been laid off in exchange for them doing a um, certain number of hours of volunteer work or community wow. service um, with the idea of sort of forming a bridge until they can get another job and so we've um, done that now for for a few years and that's been um, you know again it helps it's certainly not a panacea to, um, for folks once a person does get sick how can they rely on the current health care system to treat them in a way that's affordable and effective if you can prevent if they have thinning of the bones and you can pre prevent them from having a fracture it's a very cost-effective thing if they have high blood pressure and you can control and prevent them from having a stroke, again, very cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, if you can control the cholesterol, lowering the risk of heart attack, again, very cost effective. Um, where things get really expensive is where people are seen after they've had some catastrophic illness, which tends to be, you know, incredibly expensive. Now, obviously, we can't prevent, you know, even at the best care, things happen people get older, not going to prevent everything, but we certainly could um, reduce the cost. Um, for example, if everybody saw a primary care doctor and got the preventive care. So it, you have treated thousands of patients at this clinic. It sounds like part of the relationship and rapport with a doctor is part of preventative care. Uh, yeah, I think that really is the case. That So even for people who have a close relationship with a doctor, those are hard to get people to change, but I think it's much more likely than if they have no relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think studies have shown that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of the improvements you've made into the, in the building in the 2005 Best Award? We, um, well, this is a, it's a very nice building, but it's, it's 40 plus years old, and so it's sort of a, an energy sieve. Uh, so we, we actually replaced the roof and found there was essentially no insulation. We put in, um, I think we're the first medical clinic, at least in Oregon, to do solar power um, and um, with some support from the Energy Trust. And so that um, helps, particularly in the summer, run the meter back. So we saved some money with that. And then um, over time, we've also tried to you know, as we replace things, use the double pane glass, put in more insulation, et cetera. We've also tried to then move to give, um, to help our employees save 
money. For example, we had a program where we gave out compact fluorescent light bulbs to patients, but we also gave some to every employee. We give $100 um, per employee up to once a year for any new energy star appliance. You know, and I think these are things that are not, they're not that costly, and I think that other businesses could do that. If we look at health in a broader, you know, thinking of the health of the city or the nation or the planet, it's incumbent on us to do things to try and improve the community health. Well, Dr. Coodley, please um, know that we're very impressed with your efforts here, and I wish you the very best of luck in continuing um, your sustainability practices and targeting some of the problems in our healthcare system. Thank you, but I'm, I, one of the things I should point out is it's a, it's a group effort here, not just me, and um, the way we're organized is about half the people who work here are co-owners, and so we try and get you know input from people and having that buy-in from everybody about, yeah, let's uh, do something to save energy, or we, we're real proud of being able to give to like the local elementary schools, um, and that sort of comes from the group, and I think the group is sort of, I mean, people want to make a, a decent living, but it's sort of not to make the most money of any place in town. Thank you so much for all you do, and I wish you the very best in your continued efforts. You. This is Kim Cameron bringing you the tools to make you more sustainable today. So John, before uh, that video, we were um, uh, you were talking about how everybody shows up at the um, at the ER instead of uh, <coughs> having regular preventative care, and that's obviously not a very good workaround. So what's currently happening and being done about it in Oregon? I've heard rumors about the Oregon Health Plan sort of devolving and so forth. So what is going on, and what's happening in Oregon now? Well, uh, the the legislature did took two steps. One is they referred to the voters a measure that would raise the cigarette tax to uh, expand uh, medical coverage for children. Okay. Uh, that will be on the ballot, I believe, in, uh, in November. And secondly, they passed a, uh, a bill, was, I believe it was Senate Bill 329, that sets up a process to try to expand medical coverage for the 17% of our the 600,000 Oregonians who currently don't have it. That would, if, if the bill works, and I certainly hope it does, that would begin to happen in 2010. So those are both positive things. But, but a long way out. That's a long way out. Yeah. And I guess the, the point I'd like to make to, to your viewers is that, the, the, that I believe that the, right now the, 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 the whole debate is being miscast as mm -hmm. just an insurance problem. Yes. That's what they did in Massachusetts, that's what they did in California, and to some extent what we did in Oregon. Uh -huh. But just getting everybody covered without dealing with what you're buying or, 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 or you know, how we define a benefit in terms of the health produced or this inefficient system through which we deliver health care doesn't control the cost side of it. Right. So you could expand coverage for kids by raising the cigarette tax, and I support that. But in two years, if we don't control costs, we're going to be throwing them back overboard again. Right. So, so the real mm -hmm. question is to, is, is to ask, ask yourself, first of all, what, what's changed since we set up this system 50 years ago? Uh -huh. And, 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 and reevaluate sort of the underlying assumptions of the current system. The second is what do we mean by a benefit, a healthcare benefit? I mean, we talk uh -huh. about it without as asking ourselves oh, sure. or recognizing that an awful lot of what we spend in our medical system has nothing, has no beneficial value. All that paperwork. <laughs> um, I have to there write are, out there... my, my, uh, my birth date on about five different forms. Right. It's like, good. Over Lord. and over again, as if it changed. Yes, right? yeah. Right, right. <laughs> if you'd be suddenly, yeah. Or, or my age and my birth date, right. which seems like a sanity question. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so we have to be a bit more sophisticated about, I mean, I had a, a friend who is a, in the labor movement who told me that his, that his benefits c continued to get eroded. And I said, mm -hmm. what does that look like? He says, well, we have higher co-pays and more deductibles. I said, that's not your benefits, that's yeah. what you're paying for your benefits. Right. Well. So we need to ask ourselves, what is it we're buying? And then finally, we have this insane system through which we deliver health care that creates perverse incentives. I mean, if, if, you, if, you're, if you have two hospitals and one of them is very efficient, in getting some of this pneumonia in and out, let's say in two days, and another hospital keeps them in for a week, the second hospital gets a lot more money. Sure. You know, 
Uh, Especially if they do lots of tests. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, lots we, of invasive, we, horrible we, tests we, uh, to that poor sick person. <laughs> well, you know, some tests are necessary. I mean, I, I don't know. want to say they're all unnecessary, <laughs> but I think the point is that what we reimburse for is doing is procedures and doing things right. rather than spending time with the individual actually yeah. helping them understand this, this complex system and helping them navigate their way through it. So if you don't fix those things, you can cover everybody and it's still not going to solve the problem. So I'm guessing that some of the models that we see popping up around the country, like the one you referred to in Massachusetts, which is just an insurance model, not really uh, 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 contributing uh, to the solution very much. Well, I mean, it, it, they're, they're innovative financing schemes, but this is all about <laughs> paying for something. I don't think the problem's money. I mean, if, if there was a direct relationship between how much a country spent on health care and the health of the population, we'd, we'd be the be healthiest great. population on yeah. the planet, but we're not. Yeah, I heard something about that we're like, what is it? I have it in here. 40 41st 1st. Uh, in terms of countries for life expectancy, and we pay more than anybody for health care. Yeah. So, we're I mean, still we're about Cuba. Well, well, we're way <laughs> down on the list, though. 41st. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be hard to justify spending a lot more money. On the system yeah. until we sit back and ask ourselves, can't we do a better job of spending what we're what we're doing right now? And no one really wants to go there. I mean, politically, I'm not saying raising revenue is easy, but it's much yeah. simpler mm -hmm. yes. than actually going in and asking yourself these fundamental questions. And the resistance to actually fixing the problem doesn't just come from you know we blame the you know the insurance companies and the drug companies, but you know oh, you, yeah. not only you have doctors and hospitals involved, but guess what? You have consumers involved. Oh, you have yeah. the mm -hmm. AFL CIO. You have the AARP. You have, you know, the consumer union. I mean, it's, 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 we're all in it together. We need yeah. to recognize that there aren't good guys and bad guys, but there's some terrible incentives. Right. And those incentives need to be aligned with what we want, and presumably what we want is health for ourselves, our families, our kids, and our, and our community. And to be helped when we are not well. And, you know. and I, w I would guess you'd lump in there consumer attitudes or ex consumer expectations. We have some twisted expectations about what we're supposed to get out of the healthcare system. We believe, system. I think, in this country that... that uh, I mean, I, I, I object to the notion that health care is a right. Mm. Now that's so, so much, but, but, but let's okay. step back and yeah. let's, We're going to want to hear about that. Let's explore that. It <laughs> yeah. seems to me that, that um, uh, first of all, it's a right that someone else is going to increasingly pay for. So we have a right <laughs> to something that our children are going to have to pick up the tab for. Mm -hmm. That means you have a right to things that don't work, that aren't effective. Mm -hmm. So, to, so if, at the end of the day, people don't really want health care. What they want is to be healthy. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know anybody who goes in and wants to get a needle stuck in their oh, arm and have attenuated flu vaccine squirted in their system. They don't, that, but they, wanna, they don't want to get the flu. This right, is a means right. to an end. So we have to understand that. And I, the way I would phrase it is that everyone in this country should have an equal opportunity to be healthy, which means they have a right to a certain level of health care that's effective. Mm -hmm. It also means they have a right to have a good education and an opportunity to have a job and a living wage. And it also means they have the responsibility to take care of themselves to reduce their 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 involvement in the healthcare system. So, so, so are you starting to see the shape of what a, a good solution would be going forward? Anything specific? Oh, I, I think you can describe what the system uh, sh should look like. I think the, okay. the question is getting from here to there. I mean, I think ultimately what we have to have in this country is a is is a is a is a, is a basic benefit package, which I think would be I would finance it with the public dollars we're already spending on healthcare. Okay. Okay. It would be highly effective. Uh, and and it would what's be, in that package? Yeah. We, would have, we would have a discussion about that because okay. you can't buy everything. You, right. you have to set limits. And so I would oh, establish I priorities based on the, the impact of those services on the health of the population, uh, on the degree to which medical evidence exists to support that sort of a series okay. of, of, mm -hmm. of publicly debated criteria. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, that would be portable. It would not be tied to employment. So it okay. would relieve employers and employees of that burden. Mm -hmm. And then you could purchase secondary insurance for additional things that you want that aren't covered by this bacon package with your own after-tax dollars. Okay. Um, uh, there would be competition. I, would, I do believe that we need market competition, but competition would not be based on avoiding risk. This is what we do today. How do, you, uh, how do you capture people who can pay and try to avoid people who can't pay? It would be based on outcomes, competition based on outcomes, and also on the nature of the secondary package that people may want to purchase. And, and if, what kind of outcomes would you be measuring this on? Uh, you'd be, you'd be me me measuring them on, on individual and population health outcomes. That is, you mm -hmm. know, we talk about evidence-based medicine, which means mm -hmm. uh, doing things where there's scientific evidence that supports there's a positive outcome. So immunizing people against polio has a pretty clear oh, out okay. outcome. There's not a lot of evidence to support in many cases that low back surgery for low back pain is much superior uh, to, to physical therapy. So you'd, you'd actually begin to ask yourself, what are we actually buying with these dollars? Mm -hmm. And uh, my point is, I think that there's a difference between 
the public dollars we spend on health care and people's private after-tax dollars. Mm -hmm. I think if you want to buy a service, if you want to buy a, 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 brand name, a brand name drug, very expensive, uh -huh. which is just so advertised in the Super Bowl, oh, when yeah. a much <laughs> cheaper generic is just as right, effective right. and just as safe, you should be able to do that, but we shouldn't subsidize the difference right. with, with public dollars. Right. If you want to know the sex of your child through an ultrasound, but that ultrasound isn't needed to have a healthy pregnancy, you can do that too, but we shouldn't pay for that. So okay. what I'm saying is that that basic package that we all contribute to as individuals mm -hmm. should be stuff that really works, that has a huge impact on population health, and if people want to buy additional things beyond that, they can do it. And, and is part of the competition also looking at the quality of the health care that you get in different facilities? If yes, I mean, uh, there's a... There was taking a, out the wrong hip, you know? There was a court <laughs> ruling... Um, very recently that uh, is requiring Medicare to release information, uh, patient information about uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, procedures, for example, a certain physician does. Mm -hmm. um, there has to be transparency. Mm -hmm. People have to be mm -hmm. able, right now you could go to every hospital in Portland if you had to have your gallbladder taken out electively and not one of them could tell you how much it's going to cost before the case. Really? Can you imagine shopping for a car like that? You should know which institutions do the best job of open heart surgery. Right. You should know where they do the very best job of this, that, or the other thing, and that information should be known from, from physicians as well. So you have to have that kind of transparency in mm -hmm. outcomes and also in pricing uh, in, in, in the system. Mm -hmm. Well, in a minute, I'd like to come back to your point about how do we get from here to there. Um, but uh, before we do that, we've got another spotlight. So, Marcia, can you tell us a little bit about this next one? Being without health insurance means paying out of pocket to see a doctor. And that expense is often all it takes to keep people from getting the care they need. What we're finding, though, is that delaying or avoiding care often ends up costing us more, certainly in dollars and sometimes even in lives. The only other option for the uninsured is the emergency room. Recognizing this problem, volunteers have set up a number of safety net clinics in the Portland area, primarily to catch patients who fall between the insurance cracks. One such operation is the Southwest Health Care Center. Funded by grants and donations and staffed by volunteers, the organization seeks to provide acute care for the uninsured to avoid that costly trip to the emergency room. Jill Gilbert takes us to the clinic and to meet Michael Moore, who almost found out the hard way what delaying a visit to the doctor can cost. Hello, I'm Jill Gilbert, and for today's Community Spotlight, we have Katie Gachins from the Southwest Community Health Clinic. Thank you so much for having us today, Katie. Hi, Jill. Thanks for coming. We're really glad that you're interested in our clinic and would like to show you around and show you what we do. Sounds great. Well, let's go. <laughs> well, we opened for business in May of 2005, but the clinic really began being became a vision in 2000. Um, our current executive director, Samira Godil, was working as a health coordinator for the Head Start program. She was finding it difficult to find health care for the children in the program because many of them simply had no access. And what they found was that not just the Head Start children, but their parents and their siblings and their aunts and their uncles all came to try to take advantage of the free clinic that was being offered. So they began doing some research and formed a board basically with Samira driving it and by 2005 they had enlisted enough support and enough materials to open the clinic. The goal is to provide health care to people who otherwise would not have access and in some cases some clinics are serving people who are underinsured who have insurance but not enough to cover what they're trying to do or they've maxed their benefits out or you know other issues. Ineligible for Medicaid generally speaking, some because they're working, some because of other reasons. Um, they have no other health care insurance or access to it. I believe a majority of the patients, but a number of them at any rate, are working and simply don't have employer coverage and don't make enough to purchase health care. Mm. I was fully employed with a very reputable company. I had a, a lot of tenure. I was uh, uh, in management. I, I came out of that, uh, became unemployed, and decided to start my own business. And it was, it's was it been quite a struggle. And uh, I know in, uh, health insurance is important, but unfortunately I had to make some choices that caused me to drop my insurance. And uh, I know I took a gamble, but uh, in the interim, as I transition, uh, this clinic has been absolutely um, a great temporary fill for me, and it's uh, it's really helped me. So, 
And I, I want to emphasize temporary because I think a lot of people go through issues through life and uh, need help temporarily, and you got to grab on and, and get some help and get your feet back on the ground and, and then and pass it on. I think that we are have diverted a number of people from what would otherwise be emergency room service by catching them earlier in the progression of their illnesses and being able to treat it out, on an outpatient basis. I came here and I, I described some symptoms that I was concerned about and the doctor talked to me, thought, you know, I guess a flag went up, she said, well, we better run a blood test on you and, uh, and they found out I was diabetic. Uh, type 2 just came on within the last couple of years. I'm very grateful they caught my di diabetes when they did. Uh, the consequences of diabetes can be deadly, and uh, we caught it in time with minimal damage, and I'm doing quite well now. Did they give you a, a program to follow? or? Well, yeah, they did, and they also referred me to the Internet. Uh, the diabetes uh, webpage has a lot of information. Um, basically, it's diet, exercise, and just trying to control how foods affect your, your blood sugars. And you want you know, foods that are going to react slowly and, and uh, not spike your blood up and down. So. We have physicians from the OHSU Department of Family Medicine, and we also have physicians from Legacy Internal Medicine. But we also have um, a medical students who volunteer and serve as medical assistants. We have some nurses in the community who have volunteered for records and coding kinds of work, and many other lay people who answer phone cals, do intake, bring oh, meals for the volunteers, really help awesome. out in a variety of other ways. So we have about 150 active volunteers. We've, we've served over 3,000, we've had over 3,000 patient visits since opening and we've had several hundred referrals that we've made either for advanced imaging for certain conditions or to specialists in the community. And mostly they are found by diligence on the part of the staff, people who are able to and willing to accept the patients. Mm -hmm. One thing that's kind of a little, little bit odd, I had to get used to, is they'll have a doctor with students and you have a bit of a crowd in the, in the office with you, but uh, it's for the benefit of the students learning and uh, it's, a, it's a good experience all the way around. We, we opened as an acute care facility program and so we get um, Oh, strep throats and bladder infections and conjunctivitis and those kinds of acute care things where we can treat somebody once and send them on their way or have them come back once. Um, but we're also, we've also had a lot of people come in with diabetes that was not well in control, um, asthmatic, asthmatic conditions, um, blood pressure and people who need continuing monitoring as well. We're catching people who would fall through the cracks, yeah. I think safety net is the, it's, it's both the technical term and, and a real term, I think, in this case. There is no question but that more effective preventive care would go a long way to helping address the health care crisis in this country. Many, many, many illnesses that people are coming up with now are avoidable, and good preventive care could avoid or catch many of these things before they become as debilitating and um, expensive as they become. So I, I agree with that step entirely. What are the primary challenges you face currently? Probably two tracks. One thing that we're realizing as we work is that we have a lot of patients presenting with mental health issues who need more care than we can provide. Um, we can do medication management and that's about it. We can't do the service or counseling services that would be a part of good care. So, you know, that's one direction, but the other sort of immediate clear-cut problem is space. We could see more people now, even in the hours we're open, if we had more space, even with the current staffing, simply because we have traffic flow problems, moving people from room to room and, you know, having them ready for the doctors to, to um, work with when, they, when they're free from the patient before. So, that would help enormously. We, we would like to be able to have both more space and expand our hours so that we could add some more daytime hours and uh, you know our hope would be to be open every day. It's easy to say it's an access problem. The reality is that few people without insurance at this time can afford it. So it's got to be a balance. If, if what needs to be increased is access, it has to be accessible without insurance or else it's an insurance problem. Affordable health care coverage for everyone is the greatest need. 
I think that we're helping by we've had you know we have had over 3,000 patient visits and that's 3,000 visits for people who needed health care who have gotten some assistance. It's obviously a minuscule amount of what's needed even here in the Portland area, let alone in the state or the country. I should say first that almost all of the equipment and the furniture and um, materials that we used originally were donated um, so that we've, you know, kept it down the manufacturing end of things. Sustainable funding for operations. We find that donors are happy to do expensive single item things. Um, we could probably run a capital campaign and get a place equipped as a medical facility, but then we would have to pay the mortgage or the um, rent if we were to do that. Salaries are harder to justify. Um, so I think having a sustainable funding stream that could be applied to salaries and ongoing expenses would probably ease the burden greatly. The reason I uh, chose to get more involved in this clinic, um, I was going to offer to do computer work for them and stuff like that, but that's already covered, but I wanted to give back. Um, I think when people uh, are given opportunities to receive, uh, you need to also look for ways to give back, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do. But I think the biggest contribution is that, that by being able, having access to a clin clinic like this when people need it as an outpatient, that we're helping people stay in the workforce and avoiding the costly emergency room visits, which is what most of our population would be forced to use in order to obtain medical care without a clinic like this. My only other wish is that there were either many more safety net clinics to serve the needs of people all over the city um, because there are pockets everywhere that need this help um, or that we will find a way as a society to address health care needs more effectively. Well I want to thank you Katie for having us here at the clinic. You're very welcome. I'm glad you could come. And I want to thank you Michael for letting us sit in on your exam. My pleasure. You're very welcome. And my name is Jill Gilbert bringing you the tools to be more sustainable today. So earlier you were explaining what the package should, should look like and you were saying part of the challenge is figuring out how do we get from where we are now where we're spending lots of money doing stuff that isn't effective to this other thing without having to spend a whole lot more money to change horses. You know, how, so do you have a sense of how that's going to happen? Yeah, I think there are, two, there, there, there are two parts to this that have to be done. I think any kind of social change involves three steps. The most important one is three. you have to, three. You have to, you have to have agreement <laughs> on, on, on where you want to end up. Uh -huh. I mean, the Roman Senator Seneca said, no wind is the right wind if you don't know what port you're sailing for. Okay. And we, we skipped that yeah. step. So right. you, and that's really what we've been doing with the Archimedes movement and mm -hmm. what's reflected in our bill, trying to build a shared consensus of what are the major elements of this new system, mm -hmm. step one. Okay. Step two, you have to be able to expose the contradictions and inequities about the current system. And we don't do a very good job of that in this country because healthcare takes its victims like a sniper one at a time. If everyone could tell their worst healthcare story at once, you'd create that tension. But you've got to like in Sicko, you know, you get to see a whole bunch of them at one time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. exactly. <laughs> but I mean, people, this, this is this has is having a terrible impact on people's lives in their communities and their neighborhoods. And, and we somehow need to figure out new ways to highlight that, and, mm -hmm. and that creates a tension between where we ought to be and where we are today. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that yeah. creates the political tension. Now, to actually get it through the political process, you have to create, I call it a safe space. You, because right now we have a lot of trapped equity in the current system. By that I mean we have people whose jobs depend on the current uh, right. health care system. Uh -huh. We have people uh, who have a lot, invested a lot of capital in how we're doing business today. And you can't pretend that that doesn't exist. There right. are, and you don't want to disrupt the system as you move to the new system. Right. But if you can agree on where you want to go, uh -huh. you can over time develop a transition process. Because this isn't going to happen in one or two years, this is going right. to take a decade maybe, you begin to realign those financial incentives so that you can make the transition from where you are now to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. And people tend to cling to the familiar 
right. uh, because they are afraid of the unknown. And right. when I say a safe space, the idea, and we tried to do this in the bill they had in the legislature, is you create a place where you can have sort of a virtual design process where you can say, okay, assuming we took all these public dollars and we're going to spend them differently, what would that mean for me? So you go through that process, you, you have that debate about what would be in the benefit package, you do some actuarial numbers. So someone who's on Medicare can say, well, this is what we are today, and this is where I'd be under the new system. Mm -hmm. So you make it, so you, you, you see right. what I'm saying? Yeah. So you, that's basically what we're trying to do through the Archimedes movement, create a shared consensus on the vision, create a shared space where we can engage people in saying, how do we get from here to there, instead of just clinging on to um, what we've got. I mean, we've got to get people to recognize that just because the leak's in the other end of the canoe doesn't mean we're not going to sink. You know, you, you're talking in terms of po uh, public policy, and I can see the importance of that, but it, as it occurs to me that the insurance industry has something to benefit and certainly has a lot at stake in this. Are they part of this conversation? Are you... Uh, no, they have been. They, they were at the table. We had uh, we had organized labor. We had seniors. We had uh, uh, hospitals and uh, and uh, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. You know, the the fact of the matter is, you you can you can uh, you can blame dip whatever party you want to blame. But what they're right. doing is they're taking advantage of the economic incentives that are that currently exist. Right. Yeah. You know, and and what we need to do is change the incentives. Yeah. Uh, we had very good engagement of most of the insurance companies. A Pacific Source uh, actually okay. endorsed the bill, worked for the bill. You know, there's there's definitely a role. Uh, for them, but we have to we have to align what these different parties do with what we want the system pr to produce yeah. for us, not just yeah. as individuals, but as a community uh, and as a nation uh, as well. Because left to their own devices, they would design a very different system. I'm guessing. Well, <laughs> ab 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 absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, just talking about how do you how do you pay for something, yeah. how do you insure everybody, doesn't really get to the underlying issues that we have to come to terms with as a society. I think that's such an important message that you've covered here. So can this? be dealt with at a state level or do we really need to be taking this to the national level? How does this flow this is out? This is ultimately not a state problem or a Medicaid yeah. problem. It's a system yeah. problem right. and a national problem. And you can't fix it at the state level unless you change the fundamental structure of, of the federal system. And what we were trying to do with the passage of our bill in Oregon, it was very similar to what we did with the health plan. If you remember back in 1989, we passed a bill that was illegal. We basically That's said, right. we're going to rewrite federal Medicaid law. You got a little attention for that, didn't you? Yeah, we did. <laughs> so did Oregon. But we, we, we rewrote federal Medicaid law, even though we knew we couldn't pass it without getting permission from the federal government. Right. The process of seeking those waivers mm -hmm. created that tension. Uh -huh. Bob Packwood was on Senate Finance, the Committee of Jurisdiction. It created this two-year national debate sparked by this little state with less than three million people. What we tried to do last session was essentially the same thing, except looking at the whole system, not just the Medicaid program. Uh -huh. And Oregon is powerfully positioned because both of our U.S. senators are on Senate finance right now. So right. states, while they can't fix the underlying structure of the federal system, they can step forward and show Congress and the world what a better system looks like and create that kind of political tension. And that's really what we're trying to do. And I hope that your, your viewers will go to our website, which is uh, www. We can do better. Easy to remember. We can a lot do easier better. to spell than Archimedes. We can do better, right? We can do better <laughs> dot org. I'm going to say it again. We can do better dot org and, uh, and, and participate because we've got chapters and communities throughout the state where so we mm -hmm. can get involved in this effort. And lots of events going on, I noticed. Lots of events, doing. right. Well, that that's brings us to an uh, interesting question because mostly what you've talked about up till now are rather complex issues, changing a system, public policy. What can the individuals do? What, what kinds of things can uh, citizens do to sort of... Take control well, of their there's, own a, there's a number of things. I mean, uh, the most obvious it gets back to the it, it, the point we made earlier about that 40% of what gets people into the healthcare system are things they can ostensibly control. I mean, you know, walking up the stairs instead of taking the elevator. I mean, the very small things that you, you do. Exercise is hugely important. I mean, you gain pounds. The childhood obesity goes on a pound at a time. If you wow. increase the exercise just a little bit, that 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 equation changes. Watch what you eat. And then we have to remember that, that that's a complicated issue because if you were a low-income citizen who right. lives a not near mass transit, and the closest place you can get food is a fast food outlet, yeah. you're going to have trouble doing that. So we right. need to recognize that we have a, a, a larger responsibility to one another to try to ensure that people can take advantage of opportunities to be healthy. But diet and exercise, not smoking, uh, you know, moderation in, 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 you know, the, in, in your in your glass of wine, although I'm a great supporter of the Oregon wine industry, <laughs> in moderation. Uh, those are things people can actually do. Wearing but your seatbelt. Wearing your seatbelt. Your uh, you know, just taking those kinds of, those kinds of precautions. Immunizations. And, yeah. You know, the other thing I think people need to recognize, and I'm sure you've emphasized this in your program at other times, is that the, the natural environment we live in has a huge impact on your on your um, uh, on your health and on Absolutely. your children's health. Not just secondhand smoke, but uh, clean air and clean water. 
And uh, the pollution, water pollution that we face today is not the kind of pollution that Tom McCall cleaned up, which right. was point source pollution. Right. It That's comes right. from runoff from our lawns, our yards, you know, our houses. Yeah, we're it has the to do with what time. we, you know, wash and you know what we wash our car with in the driveway. So people need to be uh, aware of, of their cumulative impact of individual actions on the environment as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned air quality too. The study that came out, oh, it must have been four months ago, about benzene levels in the. Yeah. In the, in the Portland area. In the Portland yeah. area. In our neighborhood, as I, I think we discovered on the show. Yes, I know. So there's a reason I'm struggling with asthma, mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge. Um, so when you um, think about moving forward, what are your next steps? Our next steps are trying to build capacity in the movement. And, you know, we got about 7,000 people involved in 30 chapters. We want to get, you know, 100,000 people engaged around the state. And what we're asking them to do is, is participate in designing what that new system should look like and, and, and getting understanding and understanding it and then creating ways, once again, to highlight and illustrate why the status quo isn't acceptable mm -hmm. in ways that people can identify with in their own communities and their, in their own lives. Uh, and then there's a variety of venues we can use to actually bring about the political action. Mm -hmm. This isn't partisan political action. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's civic action. It's how do we fix a huge problem that, 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 that faces faces all of us, both now and, and, and in the future. And uh, Oregon, I can't think of a better place uh, for taking on this kind of task than Oregon, and, and uh, I'm very confident that we can be successful. We and, always shake things up here. <laughs> and uh, you said earlier that the I, I, what I cued in on was the interesting part about if we all told our stories about health care, would create sort of this tension and critical mass. And I noticed on the website there's an opportunity to do that. Right. There's a place where you can go yes. and tell your medical story. and. Are you, are you amassing all those together and going to... We are. I mean, I, it's, uh, it's very interesting uh, uh, that uh, everyone has a medical story. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I spent my career, part of my career, in, in, inside the healthcare system. And sure. it's a marvelous system. And there are wonderful, dedicated people in it. So it's not the individuals in the system. It's not the physicians and, and you know, and the individual institutions. It's, it's the structure in which they operate. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to change. Um, the political process isn't going to change it for us unless those of us outside can agree on what we want to do. Uh -huh. It really is up to us. I'll just, one of my favorite quotes is William Jennings Bryan who said that destiny is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. It's not a thing to be waited for, it's a thing to be achieved. And that's really the question we have to ask ourselves when we wake up in the morning. Are we going to let this happen to us? Are we going to step up and try to shape the future with our own hands? And I believe I, we can do that. I well, think that's, that's a great. Powerful quote to end on. I want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come thank be you. with us and join our viewers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that you will all join us next month. We'll, our topic will be salmon recovery. And we'll have a guest here from the EcoTrust organization and talking about salmon, which is a very important species here in the Northwest for many reasons. Remember that you can see recent shows on sustainabletoday.org and we'd love to hear from you so please if you want to send us an email send it to sustainabletoday at yahoo.com if you've got ideas for new shows or whatever or want to volunteer please let us know. Remember it starts with you. I'm Darcy Hitchcock and I'm Marcia Willard and we're bringing you the tools so that you can become sustainable today. There's a big beautiful planet in the sky it's my home, it's where I live You and many others live here too The earth is our home, it's where we live We can feel the power of the noonday sun A blazing ball of fire up above Shining light and warmth enough for everyone to every nation from a star It's a big, beautiful planet in the sky It's my home, it's where I live You and many others live here too